hello good afternoon everybody um yeah uh this time i'm presenting with my aston technology hat on rather than my osgo uk one um and i'm as it says on the slide talking about automating metadata creation um i almost called this metadata for people that are allergic to metadata but i thought uh, that was kind of hard to find a picture depicting that so i went with labeling cans on a production line instead so, uh, you know, metadata is important stuff, but in large organizations, um, managing data and even discovering what data you've got, let alone thinking about the metadata management, it can be really expensive and time consuming. Effectively, um, you know, you're asking people to do something quite time consuming when it's not really their, their job or what they're, what they're trained to do. Um, Metadata in itself is, is quite is, is complex, it requires training to do it properly um, and simply giving all of the data owners in a large company um, access to editing metadata in a metadata catalogue and keeping their records up to date, um, it, it can be really quite um, an overwhelming challenge and is likely to, uh, to kind of meet against quite a lot of resistance from people that are busy people um, really just trying to do their proper job. Um, so what can we do to actually automate this data discovery and metadata creation process? Now there are a couple of options for that and the one that I'm going to talk about today is unsurprisingly an open source option and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a plugin called Metadata Crawler for Talend Open Studio. Now Talend Open Studio is an ETL package, um, a bit like FME. Um, but as I say, it, it's open source. And uh, just so that I don't have to say quite so many words, I'm going to call. I'm going to be referring to Crawler uh, rather than the Metadata Crawler plugin as I as I go through. Um, now I will say that I had intended this to be uh, a demo, a live demo. Um, but what I discovered was that running all of the necessary bits to show you the workflow all the way through plus Zoom turned out to be a little bit too much for my laptop. So hence, unfortunately, no live demo. Um, so you just have to put up with slides, I'm afraid. But apologies in, in advance for that. So what does Crawler do? Um, it, it, it crawls file systems and databases. Um, effectively, you point it at a file system um, or a database and it will for every data source that it finds, which can be uh, vector data or raster data, it will create a, a metadata record for it. Um, and it does that by in kind of two parts. The first part is that it, uh, it, it automatically derives as much of the metadata as it can. Um, now for a vector data source, that's going to be things like the title, which it derives from uh, from the file path or the database name and the, the table name. Uh, it can derive obviously the geographic extent and the coordinate system, um, things like the, the, the last update date for the, met for the, the data source. Um, often uh, link, online links, if, uh, like a, a database connection string um, would be a, a good example of another thing that it can, that it can derive. And then for the elements that it can't derive automatically, uh, like abstracts and contact details, uh, it, it sticks placeholder metadata in for the moment and we'll, we'll come back to that element later. So for each metadata record, so for each data source that Crawler discovers, it creates a metadata record for it. Um, and it, for vector data sources, it also creates a feature catalogue record which is a different type of metadata that actually um, describes the, the attribute table for the, the database uh, table or, the, or the, the, the vector data source. And it links those together so that for each metadata record, you've also got a linked feature catalog record. And it can either just uh, provide you with those records as XML files, or if you provide it with a metadata catalog that has a transactional CSW endpoint, which means that it can actually uh, insert metadata via the CSW um, protocol, then it will happily insert the records in for you. 
Um, so for UK metadata, what we've done is we've uh, modified Crawler so that it outputs metadata directly in Gemini 2.3 format as well. Um, so basically, again, trying to avoid the need for uh, time poor end users to need to actually do anything to get uh, to get valid metadata. So basically, this is just going through the process. So um, on the left hand side, we've got data and uh, databases and file systems. Um, and as I say, we provide some placeholder uh, metadata for for those uh, fields that can't be um, can't be programmatically derived. We run them through crawler as part of the talent ETL. We get XML out at the far end and we import that into geo network. So this stage in the proceedings, we have a database record for each data source with some programmatically derived elements, some placeholder elements and a linked a link feature catalog record and human hands haven't even needed to go near this metadata yet. And this is a quick screenshot of, of what it looks like. So we've got um, the table, the, the, the metadata title, which is uh, programmatically derived in this case from the database name, the schema name, and then the table name. We've got a placeholder abstract and placeholder URLs. We've got a URI, which in this case points at the database connection string. We've got a linked feature catalog, and we've got um, Further down the record, there will be things like placeholder contact details and such like. So how can we basically automate the process of creating, of, of filling in the manual records that, um, that the manual elements of the metadata? And for this, uh, I'm not sorry to say, we actually use Excel spreadsheets to do this. Um, and the reason that we use Excel spreadsheets is because people are fine with it. People are more than happy to pass around Excel spreadsheets between various people, um, data owners that have maybe got to fill in metadata for hundreds of, of records can copy and paste in bulk. We can use things like drop down lists to, to, put, um, to add uh, controlled fields. Um, and basically, again, it, this is kind of minimal friction for, for people to actually fill in the records. So what we do is we, is we have a template, an Excel template that we use, and then we generate, uh, we auto generate a row for each, each metadata record using that title um, database dot schema name dot table name um, protocol uh, so that we can match it to the actual metadata. So this is an example of what it looks like. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, and we have two of these. We have one for the abstract and keywords and things and one for contact details. Um, and then what we can do is we can use the Geo Network API to actually update the metadata records with the values in the CSV. So we can write a little bit of Python to iterate through the CSV and find the matching records and, um, and update them with the unique, the unique values, like the, a unique abstract and keywords and such, such like. So just showing that workflow here. Um, so we, we provide a, a CSV file and we go and it's got the title in it. So we go and look up uh, the record that, um, that relates to that title using the Geo Network API, which gives us the actual unique identifier for the, the, uh, for the record in, in the metadata catalog. And then uh, we update that record with the rest of the, uh, the data from the, uh, the CSV file. And again, we're pointing that at Geo Network. So for extra geek points we can automate this even further um, and we can allow people to send us that csv file uh, to an email address which we've actually associated with an s3 bucket so people send an email address to for example my metadata at metadata.astontechnology.com we have an s3 bucket that 
is uh, associated with that email address so the email gets stored in the S3 bucket. With another little bit of Python we can extract the CSV file from that um, from that email we can make sure it is a CSV file and not a photo of someone's cats or something uh, and then basically place it somewhere where the the Python script that we previously saw can actually process it. So yeah we have an email which has got the CSV attached to it we pop that in an S3 bucket we run it through some more Python and into into Geo Network. So at the end of this process, we have uh, fully, and, and let's say we repeat that for the CSV file that's got contact details in it as well. At the end of this process, we have fully completed metadata records with all of the unique elements in it. Um, now people can send us, if uh, this, this whole process can be automated so that uh, people can send CSV files whenever they need to update records or add new ones. Um, and again, they haven't really needed to go anywhere near the actual metadata catalog at this point. So the Talend graphical user interface is a bit scary to start with, but um, it's, quite, uh, it, it, it's quite clever in that you can enable or disable parts of the workflow. So if you don't have any, if you don't want it to scan for, say, raster, um, records for raster data sets then you can disable that if you don't want it to actually publish metadata to a metadata catalog then you can you can disable that so that it just produces the xml files you can get it to do things like send a log file by email which is very handy obviously um, and uh, and basically within the talent interface you can you can tweak it to your heart's content um, you can do things like configure the, 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 the placeholder elements, uh, you can configure the database that you're going to point it at or the file system that you're going to point it at. Um, you know, obviously choose which metadata catalogue you want to put things in. Um, and then the really, really nice thing is that once you've configured Crawler to, to the way that you want it to run, you can export it as a batch file that will work in Windows or a shell script for Linux um, and then allow it to run as an unattended uh, scheduled task or even actually as a web service in something like Tomcat. And when you've got it running uh, at the command line, you can, uh, you can override the config. So if you want it to point at a different file system or a different database or use a different metadata catalog, then you can do that at the command line rather than having to go back and reconfigure it in the graphical interface. So the really, the really good thing about this is that um, it's a one-off task to kind of set it up and get it running, get it configured to your, to your liking. But once you've done that, then you've got something that you can run on multiple different servers. You don't have to reconfigure it because you can override that config at the command line. Um, and you could just set it off and run it. You know, if you've configured it to send emails when there's a problem, then you'll obviously you'll know that you'll, you'll know what's going on. So, so I was going to do a demo, to, okay. um, but uh, as I say, my, my laptop couldn't really cope with doing the demo and running um, and running at Zoom at the same time. So um, so uh, you, you miss out on the on the, the demo element, but yeah, just to just to summarise, which I've just really said, is that uh, this this system crawler does take a little bit of um, initial config and uh, and set up. But once you've done that, what you've got is a is a system that can automatically find data sources and create metadata for them, um, and allow those data owners just to do the minimum bit of work that they need to. To, to keep them up to date by sending spreadsheets. Um, and the end of it, we get perfectly valid metadata, um, you know, as I say, with, with really very little uh, human touch. So it takes a couple of components to get it up and running. Uh, there's obviously Talend itself, and it's the open source version of Talend that we use. Then there is Talend Spatial, which is the geospatial plugin. And then finally, there's the workspace metadata crawler, which is a crawler itself. 
but those are the those are the three elements that you need to to get it working and that's it if you've got any questions um then do give me a shout you can find me at joe cook at aston technology that should be dot com obviously huh. um yeah so no uh, joe cook at aston technology dot com and uh yeah that's that's me that's me done great thank you very much joe uh that that was really interesting um um if anybody does have any more questions please do send them through uh you've got a, a couple I, I really like the the fact that you talked about using excel and um you know there's this kind of perception that Excel is not great and we should be doing something with far more complicated, far more advanced than working with Excel. But it's a great program and it can do all sorts of things. So it's, it's really interesting to hear how you integrated it into this workflow. Um, have you had any feedback from people providing data through Excel uh, and have they found it easy and useful? I suppose, have they actually done it is the key question. Have we actually done this in real life? Uh, yes, we, we, I mean, we are, we're in the process of rolling it out for a number of our, of our metadata clients, um, basically as part of what we call uh, an enterprise metadata package. And yeah, it, all in all, they're pretty happy to send us spreadsheets rather than worrying about, um, effectively worrying about giving access to the metadata catalog itself to lots and lots of data owners. I mean, you could be for large organizations, you could be talking about maybe 50 or 60 different data owners in different departments. Um, and I think the sheer uh, complexity of, of managing, uh, even just training everybody to use a metadata catalog, for giving them, giving them access, all becomes, um, you know, becomes very difficult. So yeah, they're all, they're all really happy just to have to, not to have to do that. Yeah, we've, we've had a, a comment from Tony S. Uh, he says, uh, could you just make it a Google Sheet or something similar rather than Excel spreadsheets? Uh, well, the, the, the aim of the game is to, um, is to basically get it sent as a CSV file. So yes, it, it, could, be, it could be sent as a, um, as a it, it could be filled in as a Google spreadsheet. Or, or anything like that as long as at the end of the day we can have it sent to us as a csv file attached to attached to an email um, but yeah google spread google sheets work really really well for those organizations where it's um something that they're allowed to use which for a lot of the organizations that we actually work with isn't necessarily the case yeah um yeah, are there any other areas where you've thought of this kind of data input might might be useful um i know that's a very general question so if, if you haven't that's fine I, I was just trying to think of someone i can't think of any off the top of my head but i'm sure well, there must be some as, as it as it happens um and we didn't we didn't plan this question at all um as it happens we actually do this quite a lot um particularly for sort of um bulk updates of, of metadata so some of our other clients um have a need to maybe do a, to change the uh, the online resource indicator in a metadata record for maybe 200 records at a time. And whilst it's sometimes possible to do that in the catalog itself, again, it's, um, it's also very, very easy for them to, to provide that as a, as a spreadsheet. So yeah, we have quite a lot of little uh, Python modules where we, we take the values in a CSV file. We generally, we use the, the API um, to update the metadata records. In some very, uh, very edge cases, we use the backend database as well. But mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, the CSV file, or, or rather the Excel spreadsheet to CSV file approach is, um, actually works really, really well. Obviously, in our Python modules, we include a lot of error catching in case there are problems. But yeah, uh, and... but yeah um, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a general approach, it's good. People can do it easily. They can share the share the spreadsheets around to everybody that needs to see it, and then um, yeah, send it send it via send it to us generally as a, uh, attached to an email, and we can we can process it. Great. We've actually had a, another question about error catching from Kathy Jin. Uh, so she says, uh, how do you handle errors? For example, if someone sends a badly formatted CSV. Um, just by putting a lot of a lot of error catching in the in the CSV for, in the in the Python script itself. Um, obviously, there are there are Python uh, libraries for dealing with CSV files. 
so yeah we we just tend to um to basically to couch everything in as much error catching as we as we possibly can um and uh, or, or at the, the very least if everything falls over completely then to actually be able to send a message saying i'm sorry uh, something's gone wrong could you have a look at your csv file again um again, yeah, yeah it seems gonna... like a reasonable approach yeah, I was going to say a little bit of a follow up to that. How with the error catching is it? If it if it can't process it, it sends them a message back saying, "Please try again." Or is there is there any kind of more intelligent approach to say, "Do you mean this or do you mean that?" It depends on depends on the type of error. So some of mm. our some of our processing modules, you know, we can say, oh, "You appear to be missing a particular element." Um, and and again, generally we allow we we send log files. Um, you know, emails with log files attached with the results of the the um, results of the the processing. So that tends to have the record that there's been a problem with. Um, and hopefully, yes, if it's if it's an error that we can tie down to something specific, then um, that's yeah, that would be in there as well. But... Wonderful, great. Well, I think that's uh, all, all the questions that we've gone through. Um, if you do have any more, please do approach Joe directly, like like you said. Um, I've also now given you all the opportunity to unmute my, your microphones. Uh, ooh, we've had a, a last-minute question from Paul. Should we consider to add an Excel view for batch editing in Geo Network? <laughs> <laughs> I, I suspect. Well, I've heard a bit from about Geo Network already, and I'm sure I hear more more later. Um, as, uh, it's certainly something that we could consider, I think, although I, I do wonder if the rest of the developers might have to sit down at the thought of, um, of such, a, such a thing. <laughs> Great.